All right, so now that it's been a few minutes, we're ready to begin. So thank you all for joining us today. My name is Hannah Storch, and I am a project manager with Pixel Acuity, the Service Bureau Division of Digital Transitions, and I will be your host for today's webinar event. We also are here with Dr. Floyd Shockley, who is the Collections Manager at the Smithsonian Institution's, uh, the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History's Department of Entomology. And then we have Carson Boykin, who is the Digital Transitions Marketing Assistant, who will be acting as the moderator for today's event. So he will be moderating the chat window and flagging any questions for follow-up during our Q&A session. So Floyd will be speaking for about 30 to 35 minutes, and then his presentation will be followed by a short video, and then a 15 to 20 minute Q&A period where we'll be able to answer all of your questions. So before we begin, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about Digital Transitions as a company. So Digital Transitions was founded in 2003 with the goal of helping professional photographers achieve their creative vision with the most advanced hardware and best service in the industry. Since then, we have expanded our offerings into the corporate and cultural heritage communities as well. So DT Photo continues to bring industry leading photographic solutions to support photographers while DT Cultural Heritage is the leading designer and manufacturer of digitization solutions for the cultural heritage community. And then as the third division of digital transitions and a service bureau, Pixel Acuity provides imaging solutions and services to the cultural heritage and corporate heritage communities. So from works of art to natural history collections or film or archival collections, our team of imaging specialists are equipped to take on any collection whether bumblebees or photographic film. We have offices located in the LA and New York areas, as well as conveniently located in the DC metro area. But we do provide service and support for all 50 states as well. We're also uh, encouraged to connect with us via social media, our website, and our blog to learn more about our digitization solutions, ongoing projects, and innovation. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our speaker today, Dr. Floyd Shockley. So Dr. Floyd Shockley is the collections manager for the Department of Entomology at the National Museum of Natural History. In that capacity, he is responsible for all aspects of collections management, logistics, shipping, regulatory compliance, property management, and IPM for the National Insect Collection. He also participates heavily in public outreach efforts for the department and is the primary contact for media inquiries and the general public. He is entomology's liaison with collections and research staff from other departments, executive staff, exhibitions, and public relations. Floyd has overall curatorial responsibility for the collections and conducts original research on the evolution, taxonomy, morphology, and natural history of fungus feeding beetles. He earned his BA in biology from Westminster College and his MS and PhD in entomology from the University of Missouri and the University of Georgia, respectively. He joined the staff of the National Museum of Natural History in 2010, and we are very lucky to have him with us today. So thank you, Floyd, for speaking with us. And thank you all for joining us for today's presentation. I hope you enjoy the webinar. And now I'm going to hand this off to Floyd. Thanks a lot, Hannah. So uh, first off, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm happy that you're uh, joining us today. Uh, I also want to start off by saying that even though I'm giving this presentation, uh, this is by no mean a one person show. This is was a team effort from, from inception through the active phase where we were actually uh, digitizing the bees and continues to be a team effort uh, between Pixel Acuity uh, the Department of Entomology, the National Collections Program, uh, and the Digitization Program Office for the Smithsonian Institution. So uh, a lot of the images you're going to see in the presentation today and a lot of the information uh, is uh, information shared amongst the team members. So I'm not necessarily responsible for, for uh, mo uh, some of these things, uh, but I wanted to just make that clear that this is this really was a team effort, and that's really the only way to do these kind of mass digitization projects. I also want to uh, offer the opportunity to, to, to ask you, what kinds of entomological collections do you have? 
and how are you thinking in terms of looking forward to trying to digitize those? Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that come with digitization of uh, entomology collections, what makes them challenging. Um, and I'm going to walk you through the physical workflow that we used uh, for our presentation or uh, for our uh, project. Uh, just to kind of get the juices flowing. And then uh, if you have any questions, we can deal with those uh, during the Q&A session. Um, but feel free to drop questions in the chat as we go along. So a quick outline. Um, I already mentioned that the first thing I want to talk about is sort of the challenges that are incumbent with trying to digitize entomology collections. Um, I'm going to then review uh, our 2014 rapid capture pilot project, uh, which was our first attempt to try and do uh, digitization at scale uh, rather than the more boutique uh, individual person sitting at a computer databasing one insect at a time uh, that most people are more familiar with. Uh, I'm going to review some of the lessons we learned from that project, and then I'm going to get into the details of what we did uh, in the 2019-2020 mass digitization project. Uh, I'll wrap up with the lessons we learned from that because we learn every time we do one of these, and then we'll wrap up uh, with sort of conclusions and tips uh, that you might want to consider as you try and build your own project. So obviously one of the main challenges with entomological collections is they're not uniform in storage type. Um, so uh, the vast majority of entomological collections are pinned collections, but that's not the only kind of collections that we have. We also have alcohol collections, fluid collections. We have slide collections. We have papered and enveloped collections. Uh, and now we also have uh, uh, cryo collections for tissue storage. And in some cases, we may want to take an, take an image of the specimen. And in any of those cases, those require very different uh, setups in order to image them. Uh, the, uh, the labels that are often employed with these different thing, uh, different storage types are quite different. Uh, and so each one presents a unique challenge that you have to solve. And you often want to talk about all of that during sort of the planning phase. The other thing that is sort of uh, problematic well, in terms of digitization, but is the industry standard within entomology collections is the way that we have our data labels. So unlike things like botany uh, sheets where you've got the label next to a flattened uh, specimen uh, on, a, on, a, uh, on a sheet, with entomological specimens, especially pinned collections, which again, uh, make up the majority of the collections, they're often stacked, sometimes quite tightly, and sometimes there are many labels, and they're all pinned directly under the specimen uh, in the collection. So in order to digitize both the specimen and the labels, you have to remove the labels, you have to stage the specimen and the labels in such a way that you can capture one image, uh, and then you have to put them back. And in entomology, the label order is absolutely critical because it tells a historical uh, it puts things into a historical context. And so the label order has to be maintained in perpetuity. So uh, the short uh, version of that is everything has to go back on in the exact same order that they came off. The other thing uh, is that not all insects are perfectly sized or shaped for being included in a mass digitization project. So um, because they vary widely in size and shape and uh, and uh, some are long, short, uh, some are mi almost microscopic. Um, some of these you have, to, you have to take into consideration, but also you have to consider what is the industry standard for the particular kind of insect you're, you're shooting. For example, uh, in bumblebees, we often photograph those laterally, uh, but for carpenter bees, the standard is actually photographing them dorsally. And so that means that if you're doing both kinds of bees, you have to have a switch in the staging process so that you can count for the fact that the specimen is now going to be pinned in a different orientation, but still has to be at the exact same height. Uh, insect collections are also uh, incredibly large. As many of you probably know, um, insect collections offer sort of the biggest bang for your buck in terms of the amount of material and the amount of data trapped in the, in the collection. 
And so um, many of them are just too large to employ a traditional manual data entry model. Uh, just using our own collection as an example, 35 million specimens at the roughly 100 specimens per person per day uh, would take 1,346 years working five days a week, which obviously that's not a great way to go about it. Even if you increased it by a factor of 20, it would still take 67 years to do a collection the size of ours uh, at doing a manual data entry model. So uh, using mass digitization is really the only hope we have for getting such a large collection as, of, as we have ever into a digital form where we have both data and digital surrogates um, that, that can be publicly accessible. So today, uh, I'm gonna talk mainly about the physical workflow. Um, there are basically three workflows that uh, we're operating cooperatively and simultaneously uh, during our mass digitization project. The physical was basically the specimen handling. The imaging is self-explanatory. The virtual is a little bit harder to explain. It includes all of sort of the data management side, the back end of what happens to the data, the transcription side and how we handled all that. Uh, again, I'm only going to focus on the physical. That was the part of the of the pre or that was the part of the project that I was mainly in charge of. But if you're interested in uh, the imaging and virtual workflows, uh, feel free to tune in. In two weeks, uh, there's going to be a follow up session uh, where my counterpart in collections information, Jessica Bird, and Hannah will be talking a little bit more about both the overall sort of holistic uh, project, uh, but they'll be able to talk more specifically about the imaging and virtual aspects of the workflow. Uh, I, I have more than enough to talk about just from the physical side. So uh, the 2014 Rapid Capture Project, this was our first foray into trying to capture a large amount of material in a short amount of time. Um, bumblebees were selected. Uh, based on their size, they were 3D, they were medium-sized insects, mostly their uniform and size based on species, and of course, it doesn't hurt that they're important as pollinators, so there was a lot of uh, interest in getting those digitized anyway. The uh, bumblebee collection had also been recently curated, and so uh, having, the con having the collection pre-curated before you get into the project is critical for successful uh, mass digitization. The only problem is, is we didn't have space sufficient enough for the imaging suite needed to do this uh, at the scale that we were trying to accomplish. So that meant that uh, the entire bumblebee collection had to be moved out of entomology in chunks, imaged, and then brought back. And that presents its own challenges. Um, unfortunately, the space that we had, um, it worked fine, obviously. 45,000 bees in 40 working days is, is nothing to sneeze at. Um, but it also, uh, because of its shape and its size, only a certain number of people could be working in the space at a time without clogging up the workflow. Um, we didn't want to have people bumping the tables that the specimens were on, and I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, and rather than having it so that it flowed smoothly, the specimens had to come out of the processing area to the imaging station and then be brought back. Uh, and we had a chance to sort of improve that in the 2019 a model. So here's the 2014 team. And the only thing I want to sort of point out is the number of names uh, on this list, right? Um, when we when they did the 2014 pilot, it required a huge number of people um, to, to pull off. And uh, quite a few people were just dedicated to specimen processing. And we were using people wherever we could find them. Mostly, most of these folks were collection program technicians that were temporarily assigned to the project. Um, and so uh, we had a huge number of people all trying to work in this really small space, uh, as well as interacting with the key leads that you see at the top. So uh, the specimen processing probably looks very similar to what you might do if you were doing it uh, boutique style, um, one at a time. Uh, we have to basically remove the specimens from the collection um, we have to take them somewhere uh, where we can pull them out of the unit trays. We have to. We had to build special stages, and the 2014 team literally 
had to take uh, standard inset unit trays and build staging trays with foam and glue uh, in order to make it so that you'd have a smooth surface for a one shot to get the labels and the B uh, in the same field of view at the same time uh, and at the same uh, focal length. So, um, and all of this requires hands, right? Someone's gotta be pulling the individual bees out, someone's gotta be removing the labels, someone's gotta be staging the specimens, then the specimens actually get imaged, and then you gotta put everything back. And of course, not everybody's gonna be able to do all of those things very well. As a matter of fact, we don't want people who don't aren't familiar with entomological collections handling delicate specimens uh, until they've had some training, right? Um, we didn't have very much in the way of damage, so the team did a great job. There's no doubt about it. Um, one of the challenges that they had because of the small space and because of how quickly the 2014 project came together uh, was again, the shape of the room was kind of strange. Um, the location of the imaging equipment wasn't exactly right for the disassembly and reassembly uh, process, which I'll talk about more when I get to the 2019 process. The table surface was fine. It was covered with a, with a uh, smooth surface white paper, um, but uh, there were no rails or anything. Um, and so they had to improvise some rails. Uh, and you can see them in the image on the upper left, uh, what we're talking about. And that's basically just to keep the trays from sliding off the side of the table as they're being pushed down after the bees have been staged and they're waiting for imaging. Um, the other thing that uh, changed between the 2014 study and the 2019 study was uh, specimen tracking. And what I mean by that is we added additional labels uh, in an area of the unit tray that wasn't being imaged, but helped the technicians and in, in our case, the contractors uh, put the specimens back in the exact drawer, in the exact tray, and in the exact position that they came out of. Uh, and that's important for some of these collections because some of these were historical, some of these were part of a uh, survey project. So they were put in the trays in series that are important to retain uh, for research purposes. If someone's looking for all of them from a particular place, you'd want them to all be back in the same thing. And that's one of the things we changed. Uh, again, I'm not gonna talk very much about imaging. Uh, if you've got questions about imaging and uh, what happens on the back end and post-processing, please go to uh, the session with Hannah and Jessica in two weeks because they'll be able to talk more about this. But basically, in the 2014 uh, process, a lot of this had to be done uh, manually, and uh, that meant that you had extra people working on it, and it was, a, it was a tremendous amount of work after the images were taken. We also had to get the labels transcribed. That wasn't uh, something uh, that was being done by staff. So we used uh, the transcription center at the Smithsonian to use e-volunteers to do it. Um, and anytime you do that kind of thing, you also have to have quality control and data curation after the fact. And so it was a tremendous amount of work. But again, it was an extremely successful project. So uh, from that study, we learned that we had to really think about workspace layout and human resource requirements well in advance. Um, we had to make sure how we were getting specimens out and how we were bringing specimens back into entomology. Um, we had to think about that process of how do we make sure that an individual specimen gets put back in the exact same place that it came out of after we have pulled it, removed all of its labels, taken a picture of it, put the labels back on in the same order, added a barcode, uh, and then put it back in the tray. We want the we want the drawers on the back end to look exactly like they did uh, before they were decanted. Um, we understood that we needed to modify the physical specimen handling workflow because um, there were too many people and we were experiencing burnout um, in some of this. So we needed a dedicated workforce uh, to do it um, and. In this case, the transcription via e-volunteers, it's a lot of work for our data managers, uh, both before and after, because you have to plan out the fields that you wanna use, and then you have to make sure that the transcriptions are accurate. And so there's a lot of work on the data side, uh, even after you have the digital images taken. 
So when we were approached by uh, the Digitization Program Office in uh, 2019 about doing this again, it was an opportunity for us to refine our process and see if we could make some improvements. And I would say that we did. The first thing is we took, we took this uh, from the approach of three different phases, right? So the planning phase actually began uh, months before uh the actual beginning of the project um the two to three months is actually just when we were actually talking about uh funding what supplies we would need um, the discussions actually began even further back than that so a long planning phase is absolutely critical for working out some of the details that you see here in the box uh, because those things help speed up the active phase. So the phase when you're actually digitizing, if you've spent the time doing the planning and you've gotten everything you need ready, the active phase can be very, very short. And that proved to be the case. Um, that can be one, one to two months, depending on the number of, of specimens you're trying to do. Um, the active phase was literally just physically getting specimens uh, to the imaging suite, prepping them, disassembling them, assigning barcodes, imaging, and putting them back together. Um, what still is taking longer, uh, and I think that's gonna be typical of most of these mass digitization projects, as well as uh, any data projects really, is um, on the back end, there's a tremendous amount of work, um, and that can take many months, uh, depending on the amount of staff resources you have uh, in order to, uh, to do that work. And not everybody is, is very well suited to doing the data processing side. I know I certainly don't enjoy it very much. Uh, and so you really need people to know what they're doing. Uh, and especially given that we use uh, EMU uh, as our database of choice and batch uploads have to be prepared very carefully uh, before you get that data up. So uh, here's the team for the 2019-2020. Um, you can see that there's a lot fewer folks involved. Um, again, we kind of knew what we were doing at this point, so we could do it with fewer people. Um, most of the primaries are marked here in yellow. Um, the co-managers are at the top um, with uh, Janine Nault from uh, the Digitization Program Office. She was the main uh, project manager for the Digitization Project. Um, myself, uh, who was in charge of logistics and specimen handling, as well as uh, I was the COTAR for all the contractors that we hired for the project. Um, data and imaging management was Jessica, who you're going to potentially meet uh, in a couple of weeks. And then Hannah, uh, the host of this show, was our, was our uh, photographer. And so she managed uh, both the imaging as well as the pixel acuity contractors. Um, for this project, we actually hired one addition, one contractor in particular to be the project lead, uh, and that was Hester Dingle. And she was sort of the one who ran things on a day-to-day -day basis, made sure people were moving around so that they weren't getting burned out on one task or another, and sort of kept, kept the train moving on time. Um, and you can see that we actually have half the number of specimen processors, but we actually accomplished the same, if not a little bit better, uh, percentage in terms of the rate or number of specimens per day we were able to do. Uh, so we really felt like we had, had a, a, an optimal process. So from the physical handling and logistics side, we have to move it from entomology uh, to the imaging suite. We have to disassemble, we have to image, we have to reassemble, we have to get it back to ento, we have to freeze it for pest control, and then it has to be reincorporated into the collection. So specimen movement was not so easy. We originally uh, mapped out a process to get the collection from the fifth floor east court, uh, which is where it normally lives, over to the imaging suite, which was on the ground floor of the east wing. And the only way to do that was to either go down the freight elevator, pass through main building, get on another freight elevator to take you down to the ground floor, and then walk along a long corridor to come in uh, and bring the specimens in that way. We actually found that uh, more times than not, the freight elevator, one or the other, was unavailable. So we actually had to improvise a new route that went directly up to the sixth floor and over. Uh, but in either case, it took two elevators to get there and you had to move between three parts of the building, no matter which way you went. So to do that, uh, we took uh, two of our typical 13 drawer half height cabinets uh, and mounted those on two 1,500 pound capacity dollies with air-filled tires. 
Um, ratchet security straps can be used for stability, but honestly, by the time you had drawers in them, the weight of the cabinet made it unnecessary to, to even use those. Uh, so it was incredibly stable. And we had one in which we were putting stuff to be imaged and one uh, where the stuff was imaged and it needed to come and go into the freezer. Uh, the imaging suite uh, was uh, again over in the uh, ground floor of the east wing. That's uh, it was a shared space with the paleobiology digitization project. And although the mock-up that Janine provided um, before the project started uh, had originally proposed that we would segregate them uh, with some sort of curtain or or something, we actually found that that wasn't necessary. So that never actually uh, came to be, uh, and it and it worked just fine. So literally we had both the bee digitization and part of the paleobiology digitization uh, project both happening simultaneously in the room. Um, so there's a lot of really great activity going on, uh, but it also meant that there was a lot of moving parts. Um, so again, um, in the disassembly and staging uh, phase, that's when we're moving the bees out of the drawers um, and we are putting them into these prefabricated uh, staging trays. They're basically just our unit trays with varying amounts of foam in order to raise the bee or the label uh, to the point where we needed it. Um, the imaging station, rather than being off to the side like it was in the 2014 study, was actually nested right in the middle uh, between the disassembly and reassembly side. Uh, and that, that made it for a really smooth workflow for Hannah, who you can see in the center there. Uh, so she was just picking them up and the, and the rows uh, are arranged by where they came out of the drawer. And so it was very easy to kind of keep that organized uh, and move them uh, across the imaging station and onto the reassembly side. Uh, for this, because I was not satisfied with the improvised uh, tray, uh, sorry, table tops uh, from the first study, um, I actually had the NMNH craft shop fabricate modular table tops for us. Um, using masonite with two by two inch uh, wood mounted to it. Um, so it created a two inch lip, which is perfect for our unit trays. Um, and those could be, I made, I had two fashioned that were six feet and I had two fashioned that were eight feet. Uh, and those were placed on the tables and linked with, uh, they were basically joined with uh, two sided Velcro so that we could literally move them around or take them around, but it didn't increase the weight very much. So if we needed to move a section quickly, uh, we could do that very easily because these were both quite light. Uh, you can see that the there, it's virtually impossible to push one of these trays up and off of the table uh, when, the, when, when it's fully put together. And that's what we were going for. We really wanted to make sure that we could maintain uh, good rows uh, because they were important for putting things back together, uh, as well as we weren't risking losing something sliding off the side while labels were not on the specimen. So the disassembly line included, basically we were taking a picture of the drawer before uh, it was disassembled so that we'd have a reference. Um, then the specimens were removed from the original tray. Each bee is placed in, an, in a staging tray the labels were then removed and placed on an upper staging surface that's basically equal to the top of the bee, the dorsal surface of the bee, or whatever surface we were taking, if it was bumblebee or carpenter bee. A barcode was added. Um, in many cases, they didn't have them. And in the cases where they did, then we just used that barcode. Um, then the bee has to be pinned in the appropriate location and orientation for imaging. So again, for bumblebees, they needed to be pinned sideways um, so that we were capturing lateral uh, and for carpenter bees they had to be positioned so that they were going in as a typical pin um, but so that the dorsal surface matched where the labels were uh, and we use empty trays uh, to indicate uh, when we were switching to a new tray or if there was a change in tax on because one of the things that we changed in this in this version was rather than manually having to add the names along with the barcodes uh, we created virtual barcodes ahead of time, assigned to all of the taxa that we were going to cover. And so as new taxa came through, Hannah would use a barcode reader to set the taxon name at the time that she took the image. So the staging process is basically very simple. I've kind of already described it, but here you can see it graphically. 
And again, here's where we were adding, and this, is, this doesn't have to be super fancy. Literally, we printed out thousands of these uh, to indicate drawers, trays, B numbers, uh, cut them all out, and it's just on regular paper. But, and it's not gonna be part of the image, right? It sits up in the corner, so it's, an, it's, a, it's a visual reference for us to reassemble the B and put it back where it's supposed to be, but it's not part of the capture. Uh, so it doesn't really matter that it looks good, it's just to keep you organized. Unexpected issues always come up with entomological collections, and it did in, in this study. Um, crazy stuff, stuff pinned upside down, stuff pinned sideways, and so you have to make, make modifications and adjustments to the staging. Um, you have to do, in some cases, we had multiple specimens on the same pin, which is complicated if we're trying to do a one, cap, one specimen per capture. Uh, and in some cases, we had non-related taxa, like, like what you see here, where a, a mantis had captured a carpenter bee, uh, and they mounted the two of them together, and we were only, we were only imaging the bee. Um, so you have to be creative, and this is where having a project manager really helps, right? So uh, managing to solve these problems on the fly quickly, and if it was something that needed a console, it was one voice asking myself or Jessica, as opposed to everyone emailing and texting, trying to get us uh, to tell them what to do. So it worked really well. Uh, other unexpected issues, sometimes you have dissections, you have slides, you have genitalia vials. Uh, what to do with those? Because if you're taking the bee out of the tray, um, you don't want the bee and its genitalia separated from one another. So that has to go with the bee. Um, but it obviously isn't being imaged in the same way uh, as the bee itself. So um, those would also go up in the quarter so that they weren't necessarily being photographed, but they weren't separated from the bee to which they belong. You also get uh, some of these older specimens. Uh, you get pins that have started to degrade, and as soon as you start messing with them, they break, and so those have to be fixed. Um, sometimes the specimen itself is damaged, either it came that way uh, or in the process of removing labels, it happens. Um, so you, you, you sort of have to deal with the fact that it may happen and repair those uh, as you go. Uh, the imaging uh, is pretty straightforward. And again, I'm not going to take very much time on it, but Hannah was basically um, taking stuff from, from her left side, which was uh, from the disassembly side. Taking the image, um, there was all types of additional uh, stuff that was happening around the imaging uh, for color correction, as well as assigning virtual barcodes uh, and setting up the naming parameters based on the, on the actual barcodes. And all of that was sort of being handled automatically as opposed to someone having to do it manually uh, as part of the imaging process. And then she would move it over so that the technicians could repin. Um, and here's that reassembly line. Um, so uh, specimens have to be then removed, the labels repin, the barcode in our case is usually pinned face down, uh, and then the specimens are returned to the tray in the exact same position that they started in. And the key to this is uh, doing this very much like an assembly line. So nobody was doing everything, but everybody did uh, a little bit as they went along. So. Uh, Hester was moving people around to different jobs so that they wouldn't get burned out. We wouldn't have carpal tunnel, um, but um, it was really important that everybody did one thing as the specimens were coming by, and that increased efficiency. And then the final steps in the processing is basically to get back to entomology. So we rolled it back uh, over to entomology. Uh, through the same route that we took it. And then we have to decant the cabinet because we have to pick up the next load in the cabinet. So we loaded them onto regular dollies, put them in our walk-in freezer. And then after two days, they come out, they come back up to room temperature, and then they can be returned to the collection. So lessons learned. Um, in 32 days, we managed to do 30,024 bees, uh, which is great. Um, the workflow, in, in my opinion, was about as good as we could do it in terms of having a really good space, uh, the equipment lined up where it needed to be, uh, and not having uh, people rotating in, but having a, a full-time dedicated digitization contract team 
made all the difference in terms of morale as well as uh, specimen handling efficiency. Um, in the follow-up, uh, we actually were able to remove a lot of the of the human resources that were required in the 2014 study because of improved automation in the process. And anytime you do that kind of thing, you lower the cost and it means you can do more. So uh, we, we felt really good about uh, how well that worked. Um, and uh, it's important to think about what, what your goals are for how many you're gonna image. Um, based on our two studies, we're coming in between uh, 1,000 and 1,200 specimens per day on average. That's a tenfold increase uh, over what we were accomplishing uh, doing it manually. But of course, all that depends on the level of curation, the number of taxa, and the number of unexpected issues that you have to deal with. Uh, in both studies though, um, the post-production transcription data curation and ingestion into EMU remains the most significant bottleneck in terms of time. Now, part of that is uh, we didn't include enough time or staff to do that kind of work on the back end. Uh, if we had it to do again, we probably would uh, include additional human resources uh, to help Jessica uh, do this part. Um, but again, lesson learned. So in conclusion, um, entomological collections, again, offer our best opportunity to capture a huge amount of data over uh, a relatively short period. If you can do a well-planned, well-thought-out, well-executed uh, digitization workflow. And when I say digitization workflow, I'm talking about all three of those physical imaging and virtual workflows operating seamlessly. Um, in, in our case, uh, it, we basically did 75,000 bees uh, in a little over 14 and a half weeks, um, which is phenomenal. Now, are they all readily available and online? Not yet, but we have them captured. So that means that uh, eventually they will get there, uh, especially as we start to replenish our staff. Um, one thing to take into consideration is not all collection items are well suited to a mass digitization project. Some of them are gonna be by size, some of them is gonna be by storage medium, uh, some of it's just gonna be because it's fragile, um, but having partners like Pixel Acuity that do a lot of, of thinking about how to image things uh, means that we can focus on, on what uh, is gonna be easiest to do and leave the harder stuff for future uh, when it might be easier based on things we, you know, new equipment and, and processes we don't have yet. Um, I've already talked about the importance of pre-planning and planning for post-production data management. Those are super important. But if you do both of those right, then the active phase is really short. Um, again, hire a dedicated workforce. Don't just cobble it together uh, from whoever happens to be around um, because we have found through our two uh, example studies that that is counterproductive. So um, if you can, hire a short-term dedicated workforce because you'll, you'll hit those benchmarks uh, and people will overall be really happy with uh, the work as well as the product on the back end. Um, and in my case, it was absolutely critical um, because of staff reductions at the museum. Uh, my time was, was really thin uh, and so hiring Hester to manage the, the project uh, from the specimen handling side was absolutely critical to the success of this thing. It really would have, would have uh, been uh, harder to pull off if not impossible without having her there uh, to help coordinate so that I wasn't answering questions all day. I was getting one sort of uh, burst of questions that could all be done at once. And with that, uh, I want to thank you for your time and attention. And uh, before we go to the Q&A, uh, I wanted to uh, mention that the Digitization Program Office put together uh, a little video that we'd like to show you now that um, sort of shows all of this, but in motion, so that you get sort of a sense of how this all worked. And then once we're done with that, uh, Hannah will come back and we'll take some of your questions.
So once again, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Floyd, for that wonderful presentation. It is really great to sort of see the workflow through your eyes and relive it uh, all over again. It was a great project. So just a reminder that this was phase one of a two-part series on this project. So this was the first part that Floyd focused on, mostly the physical workflow and the handling workflows involved in this project. And we will be conducting the second part of this presentation series during our DT Spring Roundtable from May 6th to May 7th. This presentation will cover uh, the case study in a little bit more detail about the digital workflow and imaging workflows required. And that will be hosted by myself and Jessica Bird, who was mentioned earlier in the presentation as the museum's informatics manager. So I guess without further ado, we will start answering the questions that Carson flagged in the chat. So the first one is from Sarah, and Sarah says, hello from Iowa. How did you determine how to pin the bees for imaging? Did you have scientific diagnostic means? microphone being on. <laughs> Thanks, Carson. Um, so great question. Um, most of that was done uh, by recommendation from the curator of the group, uh, Dr. Sean Brady. Uh, he's the curator of bees uh, based on uh, imaging requests that we get as well as diagnostics for the two different types of bees that we were imaging. Uh, and so uh, that's why we did the bumblebees one way and we did the carpenter bees the other way. It was based on his uh, his knowledge and experience from what his colleagues have been asking him for. So, great, thank you, Floyd, and thank great. you, Sarah. Floyd, and thank you, Sarah. So now we have a question from Petra. She says, "This is a complex project. Is there a calculation of digitization cost per specimen, including all stages of the workflow?" Um, so, uh, getting into the trying to trying to figure out the actual uh, cost per specimen gets a little complicated um, because it was involving equipment, contractors, um, the fees that we were paying for transcription, some of which is still ongoing. So it's a little tough to do. Um, but in general, it's uh, about the same uh, as we would probably pay a person uh, on a per day basis. Um, but we get a lot more specimens done over that same period. Um, if you want to follow up with me uh, separately, uh, I can I can actually get that that number for you. I don't have it off the top of my head, um, but uh, it's it's relatively cost efficient for what you're getting for the amount of time you're doing it. So if you were trying to do this manually, this project would have taken uh, several years at you know someone's full salary to do. And we certainly came in under that. Excellent point. That is one of the definite pros of mass digitization. So now we have a question from Tamara. She says, thank you for sharing with us this impressive and inspiring project, Floyd. I would like to know about the challenges to get financial support for digitization projects in the USA and how easy or not is it to attract people to be involved in projects like that? Are they all volunteers or do they get some fellowships? Um, so I suppose it depends on where you're from. So um, because of the Smithsonian's uh, financial support system for internal projects, mainly funding through the National Collections Program, this didn't cost entomology very much at all. Um, most of that funding was coming through them or from the digitization program office. So we didn't have to get external funding, but we understand that we're in a unique position. So other museums 
would have to uh, reach out. And a lot of them fund, uh, they use volunteers just like we do. Um, most of them don't use contractors quite as much as we do. Um, but uh, I have heard of graduate students sometimes having their research fellowships funded uh, from grants for digitization projects. The, the LEPNET digitization project, for instance, funded a lot of graduate students um, who were basically taking, taking the images and, and doing data entry. Um, and and uh, at universities, they also have the benefit of engaging work study students, um, which is a resource we don't have. Um, and that's funded by the institution, right? It's not, they don't have to go out and get money for that. So uh, unfortunately, I wish I could say that money was just sort of falling out of the sky for us to do uh, digitization projects. These have to be really carefully crafted. NSF does fund some. Uh, a lot of stuff, there's the terrestrial parasite tracker project that's going on right now that's a major digitization effort. Um, so uh, NSF is is funding a lot of this stuff. A lot of institutions are self-funding this these kind of uh, endeavors. Um, and everybody's just sort of putting it together with the pieces that they have available to them. There's no there's no one one place you can go to get money to do that. So we have a question from Abby in Pennsylvania. So she asks, using an assembly line production style, were you ever worried about the care of specimens or losing labels while moving the boxes along the table? Uh, that's also a great question. Um, so honestly, no. Um, we did go through training for, so for one, um, since I was able to hire the contractors, uh, three of the contractors, I hired, people who had already been working on specimen handling and or databasing for me. So I knew they knew how to handle specimens. So we just had to bring the pixel acuity contractors up to speed because neither of them had really handled entomology specimens before. Um, but anytime that you're doing something where you're picking the specimen up and you're trying to database uh, the labels, there's a danger of damage that comes with the territory but we try and minimize it. And by, uh, by using the assembly line style, um, you actually uh, tend to cause less damage to the specimen itself because you're not trying to reach in there with tweezers and, and pull labels apart. You're pulling all of them off, lining them up. Uh, and so there's actually less likelihood you're gonna bump the specimen in the process. Um, I, I, I wish I could say that there was no damage. There were a few specimens damaged during the project. Um, that comes again with the territory. That's why we don't typically do types as a mass digitization project because of their delicate nature. Um, they're all quite a bit older and they're irreplaceable. Uh, so those are one of the things that we typically don't do for those. Um, but actually because the, of the depth of the, of the trays, um, there really was little risk of the labels being separated from the specimen because they couldn't fall off the table um, literally, the only time that there could be something was in the short period of time that Hannah is picking it up off of the off of the thing to the stage to take the picture and then moving it to the other side. Every every other point, uh, she would have had to flip the box over uh, to to disassociate, and we didn't have that problem. So um, I'm not saying it couldn't happen uh, in a disassembly or and reassembly style, but we found that actually there was less damage than when we've had manual databasing projects. Great. Thank you, Floyd, and thank you, Abby. So the next question is from Omar, and he's asking, are you using two flash for capture? Uh, I actually think uh, my co-host is the better person to answer and that question. I would be happy to. Uh, so we used uh, two strobe lights. We did not use continuous lighting for this project. You could see it in the images, and I don't know. I think the presentation is going to be available as a PDF afterwards uh, as a handout. Um, so if you look closely, you can actually see the two strobes set up uh, on either side of Hannah in several of the pictures. And another question from Omar. Did you attach little papers with information to make the capture? I'm not exactly sure I understand the question. Um, can you be more specific? We'll give you a second to answer, Omar.
I will say that the only thing that we added was the specimen labels and our tray labels so that we made sure that it got back where it was supposed to be. Um, we didn't add anything else uh, to the to the specimen, uh, at least nothing that was on it at the time that it, she, Hannah didn't add anything to it when she picked it up. It was as a finished product by the time she handled it. So we do have uh, the clarification from Omar asking if in a single capture, whether we attached information. Um, so uh, please. So go yes, ahead. In, the, in the capture, we included both the label, the barcode, and the, the specimen. So it was all in one image. And, and, and a lot of metadata was also uh, physically attached to the images. And I think it's still with it um, as it's being processed in the post side. And then Peter is asking, uh, what did it cost to digitize a specimen from end to end? Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to refer back to my original answer. Um, I, I don't know the, the the cost off the top of my head, um, but um, it was certainly less than we typically pay for uh, a person to to do individually doing that. Um, some of some of it is because of uh, the transcription costs are still ongoing. We haven't actually finished that that part, uh, so I can't say for sure. Um, but it's uh, it's quite a bit less per specimen than the you know thirty bucks an hour or whatever we would pay a person to do it. And then Wallace asks, "What was the file size generated for each image?" Uh, quite, quite, quite big, actually. Uh, it, the transfer from the station that uh, Hannah was using uh, to the dams where we store them while uh, while Jessica moves it over for transcription was like a. It had to be set and run overnight uh, for that for that to get transferred. So they were really large, high resolution images. And Wallace, we will be addressing that in part two. Um the requested file types and derivatives that were transferred to the museum. So Julianne says, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Would you recommend this type of production line for other types of collections or is it best suited for natural history collections? Uh, well, I can only say that um, of, the, of the three departments that have, have done mass digitization projects, um, all three of them had this sort of, of, uh, of, uh, assembly line type pr processing. Um, and, uh, I think they all work very well. Botany, because of the way their, their sheets are laid out, uh, flat with the label on top. Um, we're able to do that literally with a conveyor belt, um, moving the specimens over for imaging and then moving them on for, for refoldering. Um, paleobiology, it was sort of hard to put a handle on how they were doing it because some of the pre-curation uh, and preparation was actually happening not in the imaging suite, it was happening in another room. And then they would bring the prepared material in ready for the photographers. Um, so, but they were using something kind of similar um, for theirs. I think it's it depends on the object, um, the physical characteristics of the object, how many objects, how uniform they are in size, uh, if they're three-dimensional, um, are they spherical or are they somewhat flattened? All of those sort of impact how, how this process would play out. Um, but if you don't have the labels physically attached to the specimen, uh, you might actually have a very much simpler workflow. But for entomology collections, you don't really have a choice. You have to, you have to use this kind of a system. And Peter asks, how much more efficient is it processing specimens in a rapid capture scenario than in a more traditional way? Uh, well, uh, I would say it's a 10, anywhere from 10 to 20 times uh, efficiency um, on, the, on the capturing part. Um, the, we're still sort of, again, working out if you have limitations in staffing uh, to do the post-production work. 
the transcription and data curation, uh, it can slow things down. But by that point, you have it captured, so you can kind of wait for it to to finish. Um, but I, I, I found it to be incredibly efficient. I mean, there's no way I could get 35,000, you know, bees manually done in 30 days, uh, even if I had all five contractors and that's what they were doing, just physically typing. There's no way they could accomplish that. So um, it's a huge increase. And um, we get the really high quality images um, that will live even beyond probably the bee itself. Eventually the bees, will start to decay, but the images will will persist. So um, I, I really I really think this is this is the only way we're going to solve the problem of digitization of entomological collections is through processes like this. There's no other way to do it uh, in any of our lifetimes. And we have a question from Joseph asking, when will the project resume? Uh, well, so the project has wound down. We finished everything that we were uh, planning to do. Um, so now we're just in the post-production phase of getting the data uh, into EMU, um, making sure that the transcriptions are good, um, that there's nothing that needs to be corrected, uh, and getting that released publicly. Um, but uh, we don't currently have... so. So the, the Smithsonian Digitization Program Office doesn't just serve natural history, and we don't have our own museum digitization program office. We have an informatics office that helps us with data, but not necessarily the imaging part. So we're sort of bound based on everything else that's going on. I mean, there's, there's digitization projects ha happening across all 18 of our facilities, um, and so we have to kind of wait our turn. Um, but we already have in mind other projects that we'll be um, looking at for the future when it's our turn again. Uh, sure. Um, so the airfield tires were necessary because, so if you've ever been in the natural history building behind the scenes, this would make much more sense. So. Um, you're, you're passing uh, through a bunch of different corridors of varying heights. Um, the bees themselves are on, com on compactor units, so it's not a flat floor. And uh, if you have solid tires, which can handle more weight, um, the bees get jostled. So they get banged around as you're moving stuff from one side to the other. And again, we're moving through three different parts of the building each time we take a batch of bees. So the air-filled tires cushion uh, the bees for the ride so that we don't get damaged. Now, bees are very hardy, so we probably didn't need to do that, but now we have these air-filled tire dollies. So when we go to do something much more fragile, um, we'll still already have the equipment uh, ready to go to do it. And so uh, it helps us get it smoothly back and forth because we have such, so far to go. Um, and I, I wish I could say that it's basically just snap lock uh, 1,500 pound capacity, heavy duty, uh, air fill dollies from, you can buy them at Lowe's and Home Depot. Um, that's literally where we got ours. So um, there's nothing special about them other than they can handle the weight of a fully loaded half height cabinet. All right, well, I think that is it for questions unless we've missed anything else. So thank you all for joining us today and thank you so much, Floyd. This was a wonderful presentation. Thanks for having me and happy Earth Day, everybody. Happy Earth Day to you as well.